Welcome back to Monitors Unbox. Today we're checking out the ASUS ROG Swift OLED PG34WCDM, the first monitor we've received to use one of LG's new 34-inch ultra-wide W OLED panels. With the release of products like this, high-end PC gamers now have the choice between QD OLED or W OLED monitors with the same display format, offering more competition and choice, which is only ever a good thing. Before we get into it, Today's ad spot is brought to you by Ugreen and their RevoDock Pro 209 docking station. This little device is your all-in-one solution for hooking up monitors and peripherals to a laptop. Dual 4K display connectors with both HDMI and DisplayPort, three 10 gigabits per second USB ports on the front for easy access and lightning fast data transfer, gigabit ethernet for wired internet, and 100 watts of power delivery support through USB-C without using up an additional port. You simply plug in one cable to your laptop and get all this expanded functionality and connectivity, including Ugreen's DisplayLink technology for extending dual 4K monitors in Windows and Mac OS. To learn more about the RevoDoc Pro 209, check the link in the description below. The PG34WCDM uses what LG describes as a third generation W OLED panel with MLA or micro lens array, which promises higher brightness than previous generation W OLEDs seen in 27 inch 1440p monitors or 42 inch 4K displays. ASUS were originally quoting 1300 nits of peak brightness for this monitor at its announcement, but curiously that spec no longer appears on their product page. The panel used here is a 34 inch 3440 by 1440 21 by 9 aspect ratio unit with a maximum 240 Hz refresh rate, so the same size and resolution as QD OLED equivalents, but with a higher refresh rate. It also packs typical specs like a rated 0.03 millisecond greater gray response time, 99% DCI-P3 coverage, display HDR400 True Black certification, and adaptive sync support branded as G-Sync compatible. ASUS have priced this model at $1,300 US, which appears to be a standard sort of price for monitors using this panel, as ASUS announced but not yet released equivalent has the same price tag. With 175Hz QD OLEDs currently available for less than $1,000 US, it seems that ASUS believe this newer generation of W OLED is the better performing, more capable display technology, hence the premium price tag. Certainly on the spec sheet, that appears to be the case with brightness claims over 1000 nits and higher 240Hz refresh rates, but we'll have to see how that goes in practice. One of the things that immediately struck me about the PG34WCDM when I first took it out of the box is how extreme the curve is. This 34-inch W OLED panel uses an 800R curvature, which is quite aggressive compared to the more standard 1800R curve used for QD OLED equivalents. This makes the ASUS W OLED version more than twice as curved, an aspect I suspect will be a bit divisive among buyers. It's difficult for me to say whether 1800R or 800R is better as I use an 1800R curved gaming monitor on a daily basis, so I'm very used to how that curve looks and feels. I'm less familiar with 800R and whenever you use a new type of format it can feel a bit strange which won't be the case after several months of use, but my initial thoughts are that 800R is a bit too curved and a bit too heavily skewed towards gaming where the curve plays a bigger role in immersion. The distortions you get on image Images and apps you expect to be flat, like photos, videos, desktop apps, are more pronounced on this 800R curve, whereas flat imagery appears a bit more natural on 1800R and makes that format a bit nicer for non-gaming use cases. But that could just be my relative unfamiliarity with 800R versus 1800R, and for gaming, especially at closer viewing distances, I didn't think the 800R curve was problematic. The overall design of this ASUS monitor is pretty similar to others in their ROG line. It's basically a wider, more curved version of the PG27 AQDM OLED, which featured a central box design on the rear, from which the OLED panel extends outwards. The 34-inch model looks like a stretched out equivalent, maintaining its relatively gamery aesthetic and pixel grid ROG logo with RGB LED illumination. ASUS calls this a futuristic cyberpunk-inspired aesthetic, which yeah, I mean, sure. The stand includes ASUS's logo illumination feature, which I instantly disable, along with elevated metal legs, which are wide but do allow you to put stuff around the base. The pillar and most of the outer surfaces are standard black or grey plastic of various finishes. The range of ergonomic control is reasonable with height, tilt and swivel adjustability. It's a solid, stable design that resists desk wobble. 
For connectivity, we get one DisplayPort 1.4 with DSC, two HDMI 2.1 ports, one USB-C port supporting DP alt mode and 90 watts of power delivery, along with several additional USB ports in a hub. There's also 3.5mm and optical audio out. Asus complement this with their KVM switch, always a nice inclusion when there are four display inputs and a bunch of USB. The HDMI 2.1 ports allow for the full 3440 by 1440 at 240Hz, thanks to 48 gigabits per second of bandwidth, although DSC is still used for 10-bit color support. 8-bit is achievable over HDMI 2.1 without DSC, while DSC is needed for 8-bit at 240Hz over DisplayPort. The use of DSC is a non-issue as it doesn't impact visual quality. The directional OSD controls are found behind the ROG logo on the front. It's an easy to navigate and fast OSD with a good range of features you will have seen before on other ASUS products. FPS counter, crosshairs, sniper mode, black boosting, and a good range of color controls. You can disable DSC if you want, and the OLED care features include pixel cleaning, screen shifting, logo detection, and a screensaver that dims the display if it detects no changes to static content after a period of time. No obvious emissions here. The screen coding used on this new 34-inch W OLED panel is the same as their 27-inch 1440p panels, which is to say it has a matte finish. To some OLED enthusiasts, this is a controversial choice, although I think this is one of the better matte screen coatings. It is on the heavier side, so those that hate any coating grain may not be a huge fan here, but it does do a great job of eliminating reflections, reducing diffuse light, and preserving OLED blacks. Of the OLED coatings I've seen so far, this is my preferred coating for use in brighter indoor environments where reflections are a potential issue. As this panel is directly competing with glossy QD OLEDs, there's a few things to know here. As W OLED panels use a different panel structure and composition, they reflect far less ambient light and so preserve the deep blacks of OLED in more conditions. In brighter environments, especially with lighting in front of the display, this type of matte W OLED will appear to have deeper blacks than a glossy QD OLED, while also having the benefit of reducing mirror-like reflections. This makes W OLED with this type of matte finish my preferred choice for brighter environments where you can't control room lighting very well, like for example if you have to put your monitor opposite a window. In more dimly lit environments, or if you have the ability to place light sources mostly behind the display, glossy panels tend to look better as mirror reflections are less likely to appear, and the lack of coating grain can produce a clearer, richer image with deeper blacks. This is also true for QD OLED versus W OLED, as this type of setup has minimal ambient light reflection on the glossy QD OLED. In these situations, I prefer QD OLED. In a dark room like gaming with the lights off, there is almost no difference between glossy and matte, W OLED versus QD OLED, with a slight advantage to glossy panels as they don't have coating related grain. This 34 inch W OLED panel has an unchanged subpixel structure compared to other W OLEDs, so it's still RWBG. In its default configuration, this type of panel has mediocre text clarity, as the non standard layout can cause some blurring and shadowing for fine elements like text. I don't think it looks very good, and it's a noticeable downgrade over an LCD for text quality. I also find that relative to even a first generation QD OLED at the same size and resolution, that the W OLED subpixel text blurriness looks worse than the color fringing you get from QD OLED's triangle RGB subpixel structure. In simple terms, LCD looks better than QD OLED, which looks better than W OLED for text. ASUS has attempted to compensate for this through a firmware feature called Clear Pixel Edge, which can be manually turned on in the OSD and is disabled by default. Clear Pixel Edge attempts to detect the edges of text and change the way subpixel rendering occurs at these edges to minimize the distance between subpixels that are switched on, which is one cause of fringing issues and poor text quality. Essentially, this is a monitor firmware side subpixel rendering adjustment rather than an OS level adjustment such as Clear Type in Windows. Windows. I tested Clear Pixel Edge with mixed results. For larger font sizes, I think the algorithm is somewhat effective. It reduces the red and green fringing on edges that you can sometimes see, but doesn't remove the shadowing distinct to W OLED. For smaller fonts, for example the default text size in Windows Explorer at 100% display scaling, I don't think Clear Pixel Edge is effective. It just makes the text look a bit softer and blurrier and removes some of the edge definition, which can turn black text into dark grey text. Even with this feature enabled at this pixel density, I'd still say W OLED has inferior text rendering to QD OLED and especially LCD.
Combined with the risk of permanent burn-in, this type of Dolby OLED panel isn't well suited to desktop use or productivity work. You shouldn't be concerned about burn-in or the subpixel layout for that matter when using OLED for content consumption like watching videos or playing games, but if you have the same elements on screen for a long period of time, like say the toolbar in an application, that will likely burn in over time, which is why I don't recommend OLED as a productivity monitor. Also, ASUS do not offer a specific burn-in warranty for their OLEDs, a major weakness compared to some QD OLED competition. Dell, for example, offers a three-year burn-in warranty for their QD OLED ultrawides. Even if you don't think you'll be using the display for static content, it's nice to have the peace of mind that comes with an enforceable warranty. Without that sort of warranty, it's even harder to recommend this monitor for desktop app usage. Motion performance, like other OLED monitors, isn't particularly interesting as we're getting the same elite speeds we've seen on other products. At 240Hz, this is an extremely fast monitor, with an average response time of 0.3 milliseconds, no appreciable overshoot, and excellent cumulative deviation. This is the same performance seen from other 240Hz W OLEDs, no difference with this ultra-wide version. We also get excellent numbers across the refresh rate range, as OLED panels do not change in performance at lower refresh rates, unlike LCDs. So for variable refresh rate gamers, this is an excellent choice as you'll get superb performance even at moderate refresh rates like 120 or 60Hz. The only issue you'll see at these lower refresh rates is sample and hold motion blur, OLEDs are fast, but speed can only take you so far at a refresh rate like 60Hz. As I've said in other OLED reviews, there's really no difference between this OLED monitor and others that use OLED tech. So far, all the models I've tested have performed between a 0.2 and 0.4 millisecond average at their maximum refresh rate, which is a negligible difference. The big difference though is between OLED and LCD, with OLEDs being the clearly superior technology for motion performance. Typically, a 240Hz OLED is roughly equivalent to a 360Hz LCD in overall motion clarity due to its faster response times, but at the same refresh rate OLED will be better. Similar story in other performance charts, OLEDs have great performance across the refresh rate range as OLEDs can maintain the same level of speed at any refresh rate. In contrast, LCDs typically get slower as the refresh rate decreases or produce more overshoot. So when you look at average cumulative deviation, OLEDs hold a significant lead over LCDs on average, and like the other graphs, the ASUS monitor is no different to other OLEDs. The PG34 WCDM is a great monitor for 120Hz gaming, even though it's a 240Hz monitor, so if you want to pair this with a game console and play at 120Hz, that's a very suitable choice. 60Hz performance is also excellent, although due to the sample and hold nature of OLEDs, there will still be some level of blur here that you won't get at higher refresh rates. When looking at UFO test results, the PG34 WCDM looks basically the same as other 240Hz W OLED monitors in motion. It does have a small clarity advantage over 175Hz QD OLED ultrawides, but this is only true if the refresh rate you're using exceeds 175Hz. Running a QD OLED and W OLED at the same refresh rate produces the same sort of motion clarity as we saw from the response time charts. What's unique about the PG34 WCDM as far as gaming oriented OLED monitors go is support for black frame insertion or BFI. This is the OLED equivalent to backlight strobing where the monitor flicks to black between frames to reduce sample and hold motion blur and increase clarity. OLEDs have no backlight, hence black frame insertion, rather than backlight strobing. Anyway, in this ASUS monitor, it's labeled ELMB, the same labeling used for backlight strobing in their LCDs. ELMB on this OLED is very restrictive as it only works at a fixed 120Hz, no other refresh rates are supported, and there's no tuning ability. This is because at 120Hz with ELMB, the monitor is effectively running at 240Hz, just showing every second frame as black. The need for tuning is less on an OLED as there's no difference in clarity between the top and bottom of the screen as the strobe is perfectly synced across the display, but you can't tune the strobe length which typically would adjust clarity and brightness. At 120Hz using ELMB does look clearer than not using ELMB, but the implementation is far from perfect. As this is simply showing a black frame every second frame, the non-black image frames have a long strobe length, the length of each refresh cycle, which does lead to some blur relative to a well-strobed LCD that typically would produce a much shorter, sharper pulse. A short image pulse with a long black cycle produces the best image clarity, but this OLED really isn't capable of doing this, 
All it's doing is running its normal refresh cycle and switching between an image frame and black frame. The end result is that the ELMB mode at 120Hz looks similar, maybe a little clearer than 240Hz without BFI, while being much more restrictive. You have to sacrifice VRR and HDR, the brightness output is lower, and it requires running games at a fixed 120fps. It's a nice bonus feature, but I personally wouldn't use it, and it's not able to deliver the crystal clear output of the best backlight strobe LCDs like the BenQ XL 2566K or ASUS PG248QP. Input latency is excellent, offering a sub 0.5 millisecond processing delay in both the SDR and HDR modes. Combined with fast response times and a high refresh rate, this OLED feels very snappy to use and is well suited to competitive multiplayer titles. Higher refresh rate OLEDs are hitting the market shortly, including 360Hz and later in the year 480Hz, but it seems that for now 240Hz is as fast as you'll get on an ultra-wide monitor. Power consumption is surprisingly good. The PG34 WCDM is a more efficient monitor for displaying a full screen white image relative to QD OLEDs like the AW3423DWF, which I suspect is due to the use of a white subpixel in W OLED panels. The ASUS model uses 27% less power than the Alienware in this test, which is pretty significant, although it's still over 50% more power hungry than LCDs of a similar size. Full white images are a bit of a worst case scenario for OLEDs though, typical power usage while gaming is lower. The color space on offer from this W OLED panel is identical to others we've seen over the last few years. The focus here is on DCI-P3 coverage, we get 97% coverage with this monitor, which leads to 72% coverage of Rec 2020. This is the same as other W OLEDs, but not as good as QD OLED, which offers a higher 80% coverage when we look at the Alienware model. Default calibration from this unit is decent, although performance can fluctuate a bit as the uniform brightness setting is disabled by default. Here's the testing at a 10% APL though, which is average. My unit shipped with a warmer color tone and the color space was set to a wide gamut by default, leading to oversaturation for SDR content that uses the Rec. 709 color space like YouTube videos. Compared to other monitors, factory calibration is mediocre, though I've seen everything from very poor results to good results from an OLED. Color checker results are a little better than grayscale, but nothing amazing. What I was impressed with is the range of color controls. ASUS offer both a dedicated sRGB calibration mode and the ability to switch color spaces with no other setting restrictions, so you can set the display into an sRGB configuration, then still change white balance and other settings. This is exactly what we should be seeing from a high-end monitor as it allows for better hardware side color tuning. The sRGB mode though, when paired with the uniform brightness setting, is actually pretty good. The color temperature is near perfect, and aside from a few minor grayscale issues, Delta E's are kept in check. Color performance is also strong thanks to Delta E averages below 5.0, and oversaturation is much lower in this configuration. Compared to other monitors, sRGB mode grayscale is very good, matching the AW3423DWF. Color checker performance is excellent too, leading to an experience that I'd class as factory calibrated, accessible through just a few simple setting adjustments. With a full factory calibration, you can improve performance slightly. We did so using Portrait Display's Calman software. OLEDs are a little harder to calibrate than LCDs due to their dynamic nature, but I didn't experience that many difficulties when using the uniform brightness mode that disables the ABL and keeps brightness consistent. All up, a reasonable experience here. SDR brightness from this OLED is similar to some other W OLEDs that I've tested, as well as most QD OLEDs. Full screen white brightness hits 266 nits, about 10% higher than my PG27 AQDM sample, and slightly brighter than the Alienware AW3423DWF. We're still not seeing the same level of brightness as LCDs, but for most users, this should be okay, especially as reflections are minimized through the matte coating. Minimum brightness is good at 22 nits, and we can also confirm that black levels are effectively zero, which is expected from an OLED. This leads to a very high contrast ratio that far outstrips LCDs, even good LCDs like VAs. Viewing angles from this display are great. I didn't really have any issues with previous W OLED viewing angles, but ASUS are claiming a 20% wider viewing angle here, and the results are very decent. The only limiting factor, of course, is the curve. You'd still want to view this display in the center. Uniformity was also very good, and there's less dirty screen effect viewing gray content than the 27-inch 1440p W OLED models. 
The ASUS PG34WCDM is an excellent HDR display. This is due to OLED technology's inherent hardware qualities that are tailor-made for displaying HDR content. The key feature here is that each individual pixel is self-lit, meaning at a pixel level, the display can turn on or off to accurately display everything from dark shadows to bright highlights. When the display needs to show pure black, it can fully switch off, giving us the trademark rich zero-level blacks and deep shadows that OLED is known for. This is in contrast to most HDR-capable LCD panels, which are not fully controllable at the pixel level. LCDs require a backlight, and for HDR displays, this typically means the use of full array local dimming, a technology that splits the backlight into zones. Whereas OLED can turn off each pixel individually, LCDs with local dimming can only turn off certain zones, encompassing hundreds or even thousands of pixels. This can still be effective for HDR content and look great, but it has some fundamental flaws in difficult circumstances. For example, when showing a bright and dark element close together, an OLED can control each pixel as needed with a clean, accurate distinction between between bright and dark. LCDs with local dimming need to masterfully control the zones to achieve the necessary distinction between bright and dark, and when the element is too small or not in the optimal position, the bright element can spill into the dark area within the backlight zone, creating ugly blooming artifacts. OLED therefore has the edge when it comes to displaying clean HDR content with minimal blooming or haloing. In some scenes, this will be the difference between raised blacks and deep blacks, such as for star fields and Christmas lights. At other times, OLED can have a brightness advantage for small bright objects within a dark scene. Subtitles will look cleaner on an OLED with reduced blooming, and generally OLEDs produce richer shadows thanks to its inherently higher contrast ratio. Aside from brightness and shadow detail, OLEDs have other advantages for HDR. As there are no backlight zones, OLEDs are faster to transition between bright and dark with no visible zone transitions, OLEDs are much less likely to suffer from backlight flickering, although light PWM behavior, especially when using a variable refresh rate, is common, and OLEDs like this one do not increase input latency in its HDR mode as they do not need to run a backlight zone algorithm. With the PG34WCDM specifically, the only complaint I have with basic HDR configuration is that the uniform brightness setting is global, so if you enable it in the SDR mode, it will remain enabled in the HDR mode. Ideally, the monitor would remember this setting choice in each mode, so you don't need to change it every time. However, it's good to see the inclusion of this feature as it disables the ABL if you're finding it annoying for desktop usage. This display comes with multiple HDR modes, although the main ones, gaming, cinema, console, all perform roughly the same. The primary choice you'll have to make is whether you want a more accurate experience with lower peak brightness or a brighter experience that's less accurate. By default, you get the more accurate experience. This is the console HDR mode showing peak brightness around 780 nits. For both 10% window sizes and 2% window sizes, EOTF tracking is quite accurate, only delivering somewhat to dark shadow detail. To access the brighter option, you have to enable a setting called brightness adjustable, then raise the brightness from the default of 90 to the maximum of 100. Doing this increases small window brightness to between 1100 and 1200 nits. It does fluctuate a bit during testing, hence the slightly weird result up the top of this chart. However, we also see raised brightness when content is requesting above 200 nits or so, meaning that while we do get increased peak brightness, the overall image is also typically a bit brighter. While this only impacts small bright elements, 10% window testing is largely the same as before, it's a bit disappointing we have to sacrifice EOTF accuracy to access the highest levels of brightness, which is probably why it's hidden behind a few setting changes. HDR color accuracy is not too bad, generally saturation sweeps look pretty good, however WOLED panels have lower HDR color volume compared to QD OLED panels. QD OLEDs can produce higher brightness when displaying fully saturated colors like greens and reds. This is a weakness to WOLED for some HDR edge cases where saturation is being pushed to the limits. When using the fully unlocked brightness mode that has over a thousand nits peak capabilities, the PG34WCDM does put up decent numbers. While not significantly brighter than QD OLEDs for full screen white, this 34 inch model is 39% brighter than the PG27 AQDM. At a 10% window size, it's much brighter than QD OLED, reporting in with 785 nits, though this isn't as strong as ASUS's previous flagship W OLED display. Then at a 2% window size, we see very good brightness, higher than most other HDR monitors with nearly 1200 nits of peak performance. That's around 200 nits higher than most QD OLEDs are capable of, and 33% higher than the PG27 AQDM, although this is achieved through sacrificing accuracy. Here's a brightness versus window size comparison for a variety of OLED displays. We've got the new ASUS W OLED Ultrawide, QD OLED Ultrawides, we've got the PG27 AQDM, and also typical 27-inch W OLED panels represented by the AOC variant. 
There's no clear winner here really, small window brightness is a battle between the two ASUS models, while large window brightness is a battle between WOLED and QDOLED ultrawides. For real scene brightness, I generally saw between 750 and 900 nits peak, even when the display is configured to hit 1200 nits in test patterns. I suspect this is because brightness quickly falls to 870 nits for a 5% window, which is more common in real content. Realistically, this gives the ASUS WOLED little to no advantage in real world content compared to QD OLED for the brightest highlights, although there are still going to be some sweet spots around that 10% APL where WOLED is brighter. Final section of this review is the Hub Essentials Checklist. ASUS do a great job of delivering accurate advertising on their website, as well as meeting basic minimum performance characteristics. Motion performance isn't realistically 0.03 milliseconds, but it is good to see BFI implemented, even if it's limited to 120Hz. This is a true HDR monitor with great performance, with the only issues being its RWBG subpixel layout and risk of permanent burn-in. The lack of active cooling is a big plus, considering several other HDR monitors do use fans. The ASUS ROG Swift OLED PG34WCDM is an interesting display as it gives us a direct competitor to the many QD OLED ultrawide gaming monitors on the market, but instead uses a different W OLED panel. This brings with it some similarities, but quite a few differences that at the very least offer some choice to consumers. I'll start with the advantages that this ASUS monitor and its W OLED panel have over QD OLED competitors. Motion performance is superior, while response times are naturally very similar across the OLED technologies. The PG34 WCDM hits 240Hz, while QD OLED ultrawides top out at 175Hz in this size. When playing games at above 175fps, this faster W OLED panel has a clarity advantage, although both are similar at lower refresh rates. ASUS complements this with BFI at 120Hz, a unique feature that you won't see on any QD OLEDs. The screen composition of W OLED reduces ambient light reflectivity in brighter environments, and it's less necessary to optimize lighting positions to preserve OLED blacks. The matte screen coating is also better for scenarios that would otherwise cause reflections, although matte is a controversial choice that not everyone will appreciate. This particular W OLED implementation is also fully silent with no active cooling and comes with nice features such as a KVM switch and HDMI 2.1. This iteration of W OLED used in this 34 inch ultrawide also ends up trading blows with QD OLEDs in SDR brightness, while HDR brightness is anywhere from similar to a little brighter depending on the situation. ASUS need to optimize accuracy when using the brightest HDR setting, though otherwise it's a well calibrated display and includes a fully unlocked sRGB mode. There are some notable weaknesses as well versus QD OLED alternatives. Text clarity isn't as good despite ASUS's new clear pixel edge feature, and considering it's still a burn-in risk with no burn-in warranty, I'd say this monitor is less well suited to desktop app usage than an Alienware AW3423DWF, which has both better text clarity and a 3-year burn-in warranty. OLEDs generally are best for content consumption, but this W OLED implementation is weaker for productivity work and app usage if that's what you want to do. Another factor for general desktop usage is the PG34WCDM's more aggressive 800R curve versus 1800R used for most QD OLEDs. I prefer the 1800R curve on other monitors, I think 800R is a little too much. Then there's the whole matte versus glossy thing. For dark usage environments, the glossy finish on QD OLED is probably preferable as it delivers greater clarity with no coating grain. The big factor for a lot of potential buyers in this discussion is the price. The PG34WCDM is set to debut at $1300 US, whereas the best QD OLED ultrawide right now in the AW3423DWF is priced at just $800, and you've been able to get one for that price pretty consistently over the last three months. That's a massive $500 price difference, which I think is extremely difficult to justify. The main issue for me is that I don't think the PG34WCDM is clearly better than the AW3423DWF. It's better at some things, refresh rate for example, it trades blows in other areas, and there are some features and advantages that you may like depending on your usage scenario. But there's also some standout weaknesses that really needed to be resolved before giving it such a premium price tag. As it stands right now, I would definitely buy the AW3423DWF over the PG34WCDM and pocket the extra $500 US. 
Even if the ASUS model was available at exactly the same price as the Alienware, I'm still not 100% sure I'd choose it. I think for my use cases, I prefer the package that QD OLED Ultrawides are offering. With that said, price parity would be much better for buyers that are more on the fence and attempted by features like its higher refresh rate. It's a good screen. I could recommend it depending on what you're after, just not at $1,300 US. Anyway, that's it for this review of the ASUS W OLED Ultrawide. Very interesting monitor. Love testing this one because of the differences versus QD OLED. And hopefully we've answered a lot of your questions about that specific battle because there will be more W OLED versus QD OLED battles coming up throughout 2024. If you are interested in supporting the channel and our independent testing, the best way to do that is to subscribe and like the video, of course, and also sign up to our Patreon or Floatplan accounts. Links to those are in the description below, where you'll get access to some cool benefits like our Discord community, which is a great place to chat about monitors, as well as the ICC profiles that we generate during our review process. So thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.